Welcome to the What is Stoicism podcast. Today's episode is an interview with Mark Tautert. Among other things, Mark is an Olympic, European and world champion in speed skating, a public speaker and an entrepreneur. He's also an enthusiast of Stoic philosophy, so much so that he recently released his own book called The Stoic Mindset, which is a great introduction to Stoicism and uses examples from Mark's life to illustrate how it can be applied on a day-to-day basis. In this conversation, Mark shares a lot of wise advice on how to use Stoicism to make better judgments, deal with emotions like anger and grief, and find fulfillment in life. So without any further ado, here's my interview with Mark Tautert, author of The Stoic Mindset. I hope you enjoy. So Mark, I really enjoyed reading The Stoic Mindset. You did a great job of mixing Stoic theory with real applied examples from your own life. Uh, We'll get into some specific questions about the book, but to begin, I wonder if you could just give us a brief summary of who you are, what you do, and what led you to write the book. Yes, uh, I can. My name is uh, Mark Duitert. I'm from Holland. I was an Olympian, a Dutch Olympic speed skater. I became Olympic champion in 2010. Uh, I retired from speed skating 10 years ago, uh, and now I am a writer, podcast host, entrepreneur, investor, <laughs> television commentary I still do for uh, for speed skating. So I do a lot of diverse things. But uh, one thing that has always um, stayed with me from, I think, early on in my 20s uh, has been stoicism. So uh, I love the philosophy. I used it in my life. Uh, so a couple of years ago, I decided to write a book about it, uh, which is now translated in English, where I'm really fond of, <laughs> uh, and it's called The Stoic Mindset. So um, it's my daily, uh, well, not daily, but it's it's my you know, my life's journey uh, in practical applications of uh, practical philosophy and especially Stoicism. So now I'm a father, I have two children, uh, and I live uh, in Holland. Uh, one of the early lines in the book, says that the stoic mindset isn't a handbook telling you exactly what you need to do but rather an encouragement to go out and seek the stoic mindset that fits you which i thought was great uh how how important was it for you to share this message that stoicism was actually very flexible as opposed to being rigid and dogmatic because it reminds me of uh, a quote i return to often from kai whiting his book being better He says uh, stoicism won't necessarily provide us with all the answers, but it gives us the ability to form the questions that ultimately lead to the solutions. Uh, So is that really part of the appeal of of stoicism to you and what you've tried to get across in the stoic mindset? Yes, I tried to get that across. Actually, Kai was here uh, two years ago here in Holland at my home. Um, uh, And we had a first... uh, yeah, meeting here with uh, with fellow Stoics uh, in Holland, and it was actually nice with to talk with him about this too. And what I mean by, you know, it's I th- for me, it's really a life philosophy. It's not like uh, a faith, uh, a dogmatic set of rules which you abide to and you call yourself Stoic. Um, I think that is unwise to do. So, the 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 thing that strikes me from from and what I love about Stoicism is that all the great Stoics we know about, right? They try to apply Stoicism in their own life, uh, and I try to do that as an athlete, and I still do do it today. Um, and it helps me to handle pressure, to to do the right thing, to make wise decisions um, as a sort of framework. So it's not. Uh, something I, I tell people and say, hey, you have to do it like this and this and this, but it's more uh, an inspiration to, hey, look into Stoicism and, and see if it inspires you to think uh, better, to be better and 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 try to yeah, think of why these Stoics were all about these character traits or why did they follow this life's philosophy and why was it so important? And and I think life philosophy means that you think about it and you try to adapt it in your own life. And we're all different as persons, as human beings. We all have different roads in life to take. We all have different strengths, different weaknesses. So um, I think the beauty in Stoicism lies in the fact that you adapt it to yourself. And whether that is really Stoic or not, or it's Stoic according to the Greeks or the Romans, <laughs> 
I don't really care. Uh, uh, it inspires me to to think about life and to adopt it, especially in challenging times or in times where um, you need an anchor uh, in life. And that's where what stoicism provides, I think. Yeah, it's easy to get caught up sometimes in the theory without, uh, you know, what what it can really do for you on a day to day basis. And <laughs> some people are arguing about what this what this means and what that means. But you know, how can you actually apply it in a in a real way? Yeah, and it, it is it is beautiful theory, right? And there's a logical approach to that. But what I try to do with the Stoic mindset in my book is um, what 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 I try to write a philosophy book, but when I talk about there where in Stoicism we talk a lot about uh, preferred indifferences, dispreferred, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and a lot of terms get thrown out there. But if you just are, are new into Stoicism, or it can get quite complicated fast. So I think a lot of people are like, "Yeah, what does this mean actually?" Right? You need a, a framework, a theory, a theoretical approach, etc. So it gets it gets less practical. So for me, what I tried to do was stay away from the from from the 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 yeah the logical explanations we all know and if you're di- deep dive into stoicism you know about them you learn about them i did but i i try to approach it from a different standpoint not from a really theoretical philosophy standpoint more for my own personal approach what does this mean and whether it's called preferred indifference or and good or bad, and what does this all mean? <laughs> How can you adopt it? So I try to, uh, yeah, bring it to life uh, in 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 practical sense, and not in a. You don't have to be a philosopher to read it. It's actually quite, I think, yeah, easygoing and uh, approachable. Yeah, uh, one of the good ways you do that in the book is you know, sharing moments from your own career. And uh, so, you know, going back to 2002, when the Netherlands won eight Olympic medals and you were watching from home because you essentially burnt out from overtraining, you know, you share that in the book and you say that, you know, you can thank missing the Olympic Games for giving you the opportunity to learn that you have the capability to grow and, you know, through that adversity and give you a bit more freedom mentally. So um, how long did it take you to really change your perspective and eventually come to feel grateful for missing that Olympic Games? Well, uh, it took me some years, I think. So when I missed my first Olympic Games, I was 21. It was in 2002. Um, and I worked so hard. I thought if I work seven days a week, I train t- twice a day, I'll beat everybody. <laughs> it's not, you know, if I if I was to work harder and win, I would do it. I, I would outwork everybody. Um, but I was totally... Yeah, I had blinders on, so I thought that would be the best approach. I was blinded by a gold medal, or blinded by the win, uh, not listening to my body anymore. Uh, so, of course, you need rest days. You need to recover. Also, from a <laughs> physiological standpoint, you know, it's it's smart to do that. <laughs> so, actually, I was acting pretty stupid. I thought I was acting smart, but I was doing stupid things. And apart from that, I was still struggling with the fact that my parents were in a divorce and I really fought with my father, really also physically. Um, uh, and my approach was in dealing with it was push it away or try to first get them together. Or that didn't work. Uh, just try to push all that stress and all the emotional uh, facade away and focus on the one thing I think I thought I could control. And I was train harder, train harder. Tra- so training harder was the solution to my problems. So I missed out on the Olympic because I was overtrained. I couldn't train. I lie there on the couch, sick in my bed. And that's when I couldn't train physically, but I thought, hey, and that's what I find beautiful in Stoicism, right? The Stoics are all about uh, Epictetus draws a lot of comparison with Olympic athletes. And you train your body, but do you train your mind? Do you train your emotional status? No, I didn't. So I thought I can cannot train my body, but I can gain wisdom or or learn from from the i have to learn from this i i I can't do the same thing twice right (laughs) i'll get the same result so that's when i first read about stoicism a little bit i read some texts about marcus aurelius they put him into action advances action what stands in the way becomes the way so for me the 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 setback was not the end of the road it was more yeah more of a realization for myself that i have to find a new direction in life and that direction is not 
only working harder, is not being blinded by a gold medal, but to step back, reflect, and find a different path. Um, and that yeah, that helped me a lot. I think uh, I needed th- that in life. And I was 20, 21 years old, right? So you want, you're um, ambitious. You want to get goals and be there really fast. I see it in the youth too, or if you look at social media, we, we want results. We work harder and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And then you fall down and you <laughs> fall apart. And then you're like, whoa, <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is a different side of the metal. Uh, and I was pretty successful afterwards, but I still wasn't there uh, yet. It still took me, I think, even up to the Olympics in 2010, the last weeks before the Olympics to to put all these pieces together. If you're an uh, athlete, it's like a puzzle. You you want to get everything right. So it's your physical status, your mental status, emotional status, your sleep, your material. Your you need to get everything right. So so I I think the last piece was right even right before the Olympics in two thousand and ten. Nine years later, or almost eight eight to nine years later, it was almost a blessing that that happened so early in your career to give that perspective for later on and not just you know in comp- competitive sport but in in life as well i think it it helped me a lot in life yeah and you don't want that right you don't want to fall apart when you're 20 20 years old you don't want that nobody chooses that voluntarily but if it happens it actually can be a blessing because you learn so much about yourself and about how the the world works I know a lot of people my age now, 33, 34, who, 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 who for the first time learned their lesson in that regard or even learn it later in life. So so the, the, the setbacks, and that's what I think about stoicism is beautiful, and it's not good or bad. We think setbacks are bad or things happen to us are bad, but actually that doesn't have to be that way. It can actually be good in the long run. It feels bad. That's something different. It's not good or bad in a moral sense or in a sense that's good for your life or not um (laughs) well on the (laughs) on the count that you survive of course but (laughs) uh, but that i think is uh, a beautiful way to look at it it's something you take with you and if you use it in the right way to become wiser to become better uh, that can even be uh, applied as good so yeah, and we sort of assume at times that we, we want the easy path, but uh, it kind of reminds me of the, the Seneca quote where he says, uh, you're unfortunate if you've never been unfortunate. You know, If you've passed through life with no antagonist to face you, no one will know what you were capable of, not even yourself. Exactly, exactly. You can, maybe that's a life you choose to live in safety or in, 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 in setting back and holding everything off. And that's not what I, I wrote this book, The Stoic Mindset, and that's my vision in life is if you engage with life, and that can be dreaming big, wanting to aspire to be good or wanting to win a gold medal, nothing wrong with that. That challenges you to to do great things or challenges yourself. And that's, uh, I think, where the beauty lies in life. It's, in the end, not about that gold medal. It's about a struggle we all face as human beings right? Uh, we want to connect with other people. We're social beings. We want to be of purpose. We want to be of use. We want to be uh, out there uh, taking challenges, taking risks, and uh, going through the highs and lows in life. And that's, uh, of course, you don't want the lows, but that's part of life. So wishing them away is not accepting the reality of life as the Stoics would say, right? That's not accepting your fate. Uh, That's not accepting what life is. That's uh, wishing it to be the way uh, you would love to have it, right? Without setbacks, with high hopes and expectations that you all will uh, get. (laughs) Uh, And that's not the way life works. I think if you look back and all the entrepreneurs I encountered, all the athletes, if they look back, it's the teams they build their company with, the teams they uh, supported, them in their challenge to rise to the podium or the gold medal or even a fourth or fifth place and that's what makes it worthwhile the challenge right that's if you put up for a challenge that's that's because it means something to you um and i think that's that's what i want to 
get out there to people to do that and to learn about stoicism to stay uh, ambitious but also stay relaxed also deal with the negative emotions be emotionally wiser so you can be open and more free to encounter joy to encounter connections with other people to really enjoy the path you're on and not focus too much on the end result yeah um you touched on it a little bit previously but you you said about how you were dealing with some anger from your your parents divorce earlier in your career um i really like how you described that emotion you said uh my judgment had never progressed beyond that first impression that first emotional reaction of anger as long as my behavior was purely based on that first emotion based on that first judgment i could only stay angry so you know you had no choice there really but is the deliberate pause to make a more reasoned judgment after an initial impression something you've had to you know work hard to implement since then and do you think it's something that anyone can learn to do habitually i think anyone can learn that i think it doesn't come natural to us as human beings especially i'm not a natural stoic right i don't consider myself i I don't call myself out oh i'm stoic no actually i'm not (laughs) i i can be uh emotional i can be uh i can be i can be drawn to results i can be drawn to goals so and that's okay that can be stoic too right so but i'm not naturally stoic um so for me um what i really had to learn and especially missing the second olympic games in 2006 in turin uh, for me it was like i had everything right in my life i encountered setbacks i found a new direction i had a great coach a great team i knew how skating worked we measured everything every approach heart rates uh, sleep patterns etc um and everything was great everything looked great on the outside but on the inside i was really frustrated and i had a lot of anger like and that's an emotion and that's an emotion that's natural right when i give talks or presentations i ask people do you feel angry sometimes and everybody feels angry or frustrated sometimes and i think stoic in a philosophical sense doesn't mean you don't feel anger of course you feel anger that's a human emotion if you encounter something you go as an entrepreneur you chase uh, a goal or as an uh, you put a lot of effort in something and you put a lot of personal time or money in something that of course that gets personal so it hurts you emotionally so the first impression of anger you feel but what the stories would teach us or epictetus uh, and i learned this from him is that we encounter events in our life in lives and we from that events we have emotions right resulting from these events so you could say my parents were still fighting each other in 2006. I blamed my father for that divorce. I thought he was a bad father. So that caused a lot of anger. So Epictetus would say to me, Mark, in fact, you miss a, you were missing a part between that event and between that emotion is your impression, right? It's your judgment of that situation or of that person. And I I think that's such a wise way to think about emotions because that's true because i thought my father was a bad father i had a judgment of my father i thought he was doing things wrongly he, i expected a lot from him uh i was angry at him so epictetus would say to me if he was able to talk to me <laughs> that that anger doesn't come from your father it comes from your judgment of your father i think my father is a bad father but if you take a step back and reflect on things and that's and that's what I think the beauty is in philosophy. Is Am I a better father uh, 20 years down the road? Or do I know how it feels to not have any contact with your three sons? So my father didn't speak to me and my two brothers for six years. No, I don't know what that means. I don't know. Maybe he's angry or he's frustrated. I bet he is. But I don't know how that feels. So if I can look at this in another way, if I ask him questions talk to him, make contact with him again. Um, uh, And that's what Socrates would do, right? (laughs) Or the Stoics would do. They would ask questions. Why are you angry? Where does this come from? Uh, And is it, if you reflect on it, an emotion that comes from a situation or from yourself, from your judgment? And that's what the Stoics would say. So when I was in contact with my father again, I learned that he had a really hard time dealing with this. And and actually, I missed the father I could talk to, uh, and that 
relationship started to happen again and we got back to yeah in contact with each other again and yeah that really uh helped me to lose my anger and to find peace of mind so finding peace of mind was not staying angry at my father no it was the other way around calling him up trying to ask him questions without a judgment not calling him up hey you're 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 a bad father or i hate you for this and that no how are you doing let's have some coffee um and that yeah i think that's still a beautiful way how this works you know we we keep that anger to ourselves we don't find the courage we blame somebody else that's easier so we don't have to look at ourselves we don't have to question our own judgment and i think if you do um yeah life gets more beautiful so my father was there four years ago four years later in vancouver with my two brothers in the stands cheering me on and uh for four years i was not angry <laughs> i didn't feel anger so that anger faded away and i think for me that's what the stoics were all about you know if you change your judgment about the situation you can lose the the negative emotion and then when you lose that emotion life becomes better uh, it frees you up um you become a, a better person you be, you make more contact with other people especially your own father so that's a better way to live for me not only and i got a better athlete by that too you know My, the the lesson i had to learn was not in training smarter or harder but in uh finding peace of mind um being more relaxed uh and yeah that that helped me to become a better person i think but also a better speed skater i became better at what i did that's really the the practical application of that isn't it when you uh when epictetus says that it isn't people and events that disturb us but our judgments about them you usually hear that and say it sounds great and sounds profound but you have to actually you know put it into practice that and i think the beauty and he compare he makes such a as many comparisons with olympic athletes so i'm like whoa this is <laughs> this philosophy is made for me right i am an olympic <laughs> athlete i'm facing this struggle epictetus helped me <laughs> uh, there's another great line about uh sport uh when you said uh if you're, if you're so crazy about winning professional sports is really not your best option <laughs> i thought that was great uh, you have to be a little nuts to think you'll be the one to win everything. Yeah. Yeah, that's you have to, I think, kid yourself because, you know, what are the chances you win an Olympic gold medal, right? It's when you start, especially speed skating here in Holland where there are thousands of kids, there there's thousands of kids all around the world. They want to be the best and you get together. So logically, it's not a high chance that, that you will reach that goal. And there's a road paved with, fourth places fifth places not qualifying etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you only practice the things you do to win you should do something else if you only build a business or 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 want to be really good at your work because you win and when you win then it's worth it i think that's the wrong way of uh, of, of thinking about it you have to find love in what you do you have to find fulfillment in the journey in getting better at learning to skate fast or become a better carpenter or a better judge or a better teacher, et cetera. It, it's not in the end result uh, because if, if it would be, you'll be unhappy if, you'd, <laughs> if you're a professional athlete. I can guarantee you that. Yeah, so uh, by 2010, you sort of got to the point where you'd accepted that what your competitors do and what other people think of you and all that is beyond your control. And uh, I watched the video of your gold medal performance and. Obviously, you look very determined at the start line, but you also look pretty calm, which you know possibly a nice side effect of you know the attitude you'd adopted by that point. But um, you know, it's ironic that after missing the the early Olympics for possibly being too focused on winning, that you you know won with more of an appreciation for the the uncertainty of it all. Um, were there any key things that stick out in the process leading up to the the twenty ten win? come to your mind it was a case of blocking out certain things or was it more of a case of confusing things head on actually it was i read a, a beautiful text uh, from seneca or there was a text about seneca a couple of weeks before the olympics and um of course i was into the stoics then uh, and i took a deep dive and uh, a couple of weeks before the olympics i uh, was of course everybody 
working towards the Olympic Games is busy with medals. You get interviews. What's your goal? Gold medal, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Seneca, I think, goes about it in a beautiful way. He says, well, it's not about winning. It's not about end results. It's about courage. You know, if you if you look at the, the cardinal virtues in, in Stoicism, in classical philosophy, it's not it's not by chance that the Stoics um, uh, valued courage, uh, justice, uh, temperance, wisdom, practical wisdom. Uh, you can think about it. Why is that the case, right? And I thought that's a beautiful way of looking at it because we are all focused on end result, journalists and interviews. We as athletes are coaches. But you can shout out that you want to win Olympico, but everybody does that, right? There are 20 athletes and all they say, oh, I want to win. I want to win. We all want to win. Uh, and that's not up to you. So I, I, I came back to Seneca, Epictetus. What's up to me? What's up? Not up to me. Winning is not up to me. And that, sound, that, that sounds counterintuitive for an athlete because all you want to do is win, but it's not up to you. There can be three guys in my race who are better than I am. And if they are, I become fourth. And that's the reality I have to face. So that's not up to me. What What is up to me is that I do everything right in my approach. So I trained hard. I took rest. I didn't do dumb things. Uh, I had a training plan, which I followed for two years. I didn't, didn't drink a drop of alcohol. I did every night for a year long. Every night before I went to bed, I did a meditation to stay calm. So I was calm. I was, and the last part was for me to let go of the end result or the gold medals you're surrounded with in an Olympic Games, but just focus on being really courageous. If the gun goes off, do I feel fear? Oh, yes, I feel fear. I can guarantee you that. I've trained for 12 years for this moment and on 1500 meters is, is a little less than two minutes. So the pressure is intense. It's immense. So yes, you feel these emotions going through you. Um, but you stay calm and collected because you think, hey, I have to do my own approach. I'm not going to do uh, two hours on a bike when I normally do 10 minutes. I just stick to my normal approach, stay calm, focus on showing courage. And that doesn't mean don't you don't feel fear. It's yes, I feel fear. But when the gun goes off, it's my internal state of mind that makes a difference that's what's up to me it's not my competitors it's not the journalist that writes something about me it's not the end result it's not winning a bronze silver or gold medal it's not it's my internal state of mind uh, my own choices and actions and that that state of mind is being courageous um, and that for me i i found that that's so powerful uh that was a, a much more powerful approach for me than Shouting out, oh, I want to win. Yes, of course I want to win. Everybody wants to win. Yeah, I think in that kind of time, it maybe wasn't so well known. But I think nowadays you kind of hear it a bit more from football coaches. And, you know, I watch a lot of football and you, you would hear interviews of players saying, oh, we'll, we focus on ourselves. We focus on what we can control. You know, probably a lot more work from sort of sports psychologists and things like that these days. But, uh, it is a lot. A lot of sports yeah. psychologists uh, they they draw draw on stoicism. Actually, it, there's a lot of fit. I, I talked to a couple of sports psychologists here in Holland who work for football clubs, and they they uh, they adopt a lot of stoic principles. Actually, um, so in the book you make the distinction between uh, leading your life versus being led. And I think it's an important responsibility in life that we aren't always conscious of probably impossible not to be led in some ways at least some of the time but is there anything you do to, or you do regularly to avoid that sort of cliched future situation of getting to an advanced age and regretting the fact that you haven't really taken charge of your life and pursued the things that actually inspired you yeah, uh, I I try to reflect on life and and uh, try to not step into the red race. Uh, and of course, I have weeks in which I work hard and I want to reach my goals and I keep on going, going. But I always make sure that at least a couple of times a month or even if I have time, a couple of times a week, just not follow an agenda, not follow a time frame, not set an alarm clock, et cetera, et cetera. But 
just look out the window and reflect on my situation. Where am I in life? I have a, a, a um, in in a chapter four. Um, what I talk about uh, uh, at the end of every chapter for me, there's a practice you can do. One of the practices is called drone shots of your life. It's like the view from above, uh, which probably a lot of people recognize from stoicism, right? So it's like <laughs> if you take a moment and pause to reflect and you have a drone and you fly above your head, you're like, what's my place here? You know, what do I do here <laughs> in my company or in my family? And above your house or your community, what's your place in your community or in life or in your families and a broader perspective of your families or your country or even as peoples under each other, right? Under under in this world. What 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 do you do? What do you and that's not to pressure put pressure on you like we have to be good or we have to do the right thing. It's more like a relaxed approach, like what am I doing? <laughs> Uh, we all do something and we mostly don't know why we do it, right? We're, we 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 have a character, we have our parents, we have a lot of things that uh, we grew up with and we have a lot of unconscious uh, things we, we put on ourselves or maybe it comes from our parents or from our family or from our community. Uh, so I, I try to get rid of the shirts or the would haves or etc cetera, etc cetera, and go back to myself and say to myself what's my place in life what do i have to do so for me writing a book was coming from that reflection you know it was when covid hit the pandemic uh, my company we we make an energy gum first energy gum was suffering uh, from supply chain issues like everybody who produced something during covid so it was challenging uh, in a lot of ways, um, and I, it it really for me it was a time to reflect, and I was saying to myself because a lot of people would ask me how do I deal with this, and I said, well I know how to deal with this I think, and I was shook too a little, but I thought hey I I fell fell back on really my stoic principles I, I fell back on the things I learned as an athlete as a human being, uh, what's your place in life if I don't have do I put all my energy in the things I cannot control, like supply chains, uh, <laughs> a pandemic happening, or what do what can I do for to help other people as well? And I thought I have to make yeah I have to write down the lessons I learned from a really personal standpoint, uh, so other people can benefit from that. Uh, and yeah, that that blew up uh, after a year when I published the book here in Holland. It went really well, so I think there was a lot of yeah a demand for it, and I think that's yeah that's the thing you can do. You know, what's your? There's not a set place. There's not a set time. Uh, don't pressurize yourself. Just flow with it more. Just be relaxed about it, and you'll find your place. But you have to take time to reflect. Uh, you have to take time to go back to what do you feel uh, and how does this feel and why? Where does this come from? Is this my judgment? Is this the place in life I'm, I don't I don't feel well by? And we I think we often, if we're in a red ways race or we we feel pressurized by our society or our our parents or our community, then uh, we we don't take time anymore to stop and pause and reflect. Uh, and I would encourage that. So reflect, ask questions, uh, learn a little bit about Stoicism, about Socratic questioning, about beautiful techniques that have been around for millennia uh, and I think are still really, really useful today. Yeah, we can get so close to one narrow issue or one certain story we tell ourselves about our lives that we fail to see the bigger perspective and you know, the, the trajectory trajectory we're on, really. Yeah. And we can predict where we will go, but we can pause and reflect in the process, right? So do you still feel happy with what you're doing or what are the challenges ahead? Uh, and how can you reflect on that? And how can you show courage? How can you be uh, more open or uh, helpful to others, etc.? cetera? Um, and are you the person... And how can you make more wise decisions? No, and do you know what that means? <laughs> do you do you know what would be wise to do? And if you know what is wise to do, why don't you do it? 
um, what's holding you back? Uh, and that's not to judge you that you don't do it, but you can pause and reflect, right? So that's what I think Epictetus or Seneca beautifully said, right? You shouldn't blame yourself um, or you shouldn't ba- blame other people. And <laughs> In the end, you shouldn't even blame yourself. We do that all the time, you know? There's no, in besides a moral sense, there's no right and wrong or wrong in nature. It's reflect on your place. Take time and pause and reflect. Uh, you, you share a story in your book uh, about the snowboarder, Vivian Mantel. Um, really inspiring story. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about who she was and why you included her story in the book. Yeah, I would love to. Bibi Amentel was uh, I was a snowboarder, and she was about to go to the Olympics when she found a big lump on her lower leg. She went to the doctor, and it was a uh, cancer. Uh, so they had to remove her leg as soon as possible. Um, and normally, that would be. <laughs> For for you to hear it, some for a normal person to hear that, it would be devastating, right? Uh, but actually, of course, she was devastated by that loss. But uh, she paused, reflect, and pretty pretty soon was back on a snowboard with uh, uh, how do you call it in English? Uh, a new leg, a new uh, <laughs> prosthetic, prosthetic leg, is it? Yeah, prosthetic leg. Yeah, yeah. She had a prosthetic uh, leg, and she. She became Dutch snowboarding champion, actually in a normal category, not even at the Paralympics, because there was no snowboard, snowboarding on Paralympics. So she did qu- quite well. She had a normal life. She wasn't complaining. So she accepted that th- this was her fate. She couldn't go to the Olympics. But what she could do was try to get snowboarding on a Paralympic game. So she made an effort to get snowboarding there and she got snowboarding on a Paralympic game. She won three gold medals there in snowboarding, which is great. But above all, and she knew when she won these gold medals that the cancer was coming back. So she had, I think, seven or eight operations during that whole period. She went into hospitals, out of hospitals, into training camps, out of training camps. Uh, she had a son, uh, a relationship, and she was, her mindset her state of mind, internal state of mind was always like, the life I'm leading is awesome. Um, I'm I'm rooting for Paralympic snowboarding. I became an Olympic champion and she was always cheerful, always giving to others. And she lighted the room when, when she was there. She was such a big inspiration here in Holland where everybody knows her because she never got down. She never went uh went in complaints or thought in complaints and of course she would in a in a in a smaller setting she would uh it would hurt her that 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 she was going to die uh because she knew she was going to die two months before she died or passed away i think it was two years ago i interviewed her for my podcast which was really special and i admire her for her courage to live the best life she could she helped others she had uh, helped others with a lot of Paralympic uh, athletes or, or or just regular people who are in the same position as her. Um, and I think that's, that's so inspiring. So she was standing in life with a big smile on her, on her face while <laughs> she was facing death. Uh, and she encountered so many setbacks. So for me, that, that is like Amor Fati. That is not only... Accepting your fate, yeah, that you don't have a lower leg anymore, uh, but also love loving the life you have. Uh, that's the reality in your life. You face it and you give everything you have up to the last day, up to the last month. And and for me, she's a big inspiration. Like all the Stoics, she 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 lived like in a Stoic sense. She she wasn't Stoic. That's what I mean. She probably never read Marcus Aurelius and I don't care. <laughs> she is an example of a stoic uh, sage. She is uh, a big inspiration for me. Yeah, I think that's what's so impressive and impactful because even if you were to read endless amounts of theory about that type of attitude, you just can't get the same impact that you can from a real example and understand what she did in you know real life practical terms. Yeah, for me, that's. I think that's exactly what the Stoics write about, right? Show me what you did. Show me how you live. And she embraced that and she showed us. 
uh, she's a, a better example in stoicism probably than me or anybody else. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's that's what's what real practical applications or real stories and real life challenges mean. And I think that's that's so inspiring for me. That's I think hey, if we can learn a, l- a little bit from her, if we can take a little bit from her mindset and adopt it for ourselves. And even in the face of death, uh, try to to still do that, right? That's the hard part. <laughs> like Seneca said too. Well, he he actually had a had a good death in a stoic sense, uh, like Socrates, like his uh, big example. Uh, and she did too, Bibi on mental, right? No complaining, uh, not wishing it any other way. Uh, this is what's in front of me, and uh, I'll face it with my chin up and a big smile on my face, and. Uh, I think that's that's beautiful, and I, we all have to prove that we are able to do that. <laughs> we can say we will try to do it, but if in the face of death or in the face of a challenge, let's see what you're made of. Yeah, such such a good story. Um, you talk candidly in the book about uh, how your mom's depression made you think about death and you know about your own life. And I heard you say, I think, in another interview that. Although your mom's gone, you still owe it to yourself and to her in a way to live your life fully. Yeah. Um, do you think that's a good way of helping to cope with the loss of someone by committing to live your life fully, at least partially in, in honor of them? I think it does. I think it does. When my, my mother was severely depressed for over 10 years. The hardest choice I ever had to make was to call my mother and not uh, and asked her not to come to Vancouver to to my Olympic race, and that was really hard to do. Two two years later, she she took her own life, which is terribly sad. Uh, and that's also a lesson because it's also a disease. She couldn't get out of that. Right? It's not like hey, uh, learn everything you can about stoicism and change your life. She was not capable of that. So I had to accept that. Uh, that this is her choice, her path, and I cannot save her. I cannot change her. And that, I think that's what I had to learn as a sort of wisdom because I, you want to do that, right? You want to save your mother whom you love. You want to do that. You try everything and you're not able to. So um, I don't blame my mother and I don't even blame my, I don't, I don't blame myself. There's no one to blame. This is just what happens in life too. And for me, What I take away from that and out of that is uh, actually my mother, death is not the worst part of life, I think. It's not living. I saw her uh, struggling for 10 years. I saw her not being able to live fully. We had a daughter and and, and she couldn't feel that. Sometimes she could, but she couldn't. She was not there with us. And that's terribly sad. So I understand um that's that's not a good way to live so i th- i thought i'm when i'm living as long as i'm alive I, I i it's terribly sad what happened to my mother but she gave me my life uh and 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 i will honor that by living the best life i can uh, and by totally embracing that life with the loss with the sadness not pushing that away but um celebrating actually that life is there and that is part of life we life is not what happens to us without loss without 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 fear or without things that yeah that block our path or that feels terrible no that's part of life and it's up to us to to still <laughs> uh live a good life in in a in in every way so i think that's yeah that's what i try to do and i struggle with that too of course uh, it's not like uh i learned that i know how to do that and for the rest of my life i will be happy it's the same as i have a gold medal well if i feel terrible it's not <laughs> it doesn't help to put <laughs> oh i have a gold medal i'm an olympic champion oh gone are all my worries no it's part of life but that's, I think, the beauty in it. Yeah, that's, that's really well put. And it reminds me of uh, something Seneca said on that kind of theme when he said, um, a great part of those we have loved remains with us, even after fortune has re- removed them, which I think is really true. That is true. That is so true. 
Uh, that's exactly how I feel about the loss of my mother. It's she is there with us. The, the that love is still there, and I I honor that love. And with that love is loss. There is pain and grief, um, but um, I can. <laughs> I, that pain and grief is there, but there I can focus on the love, right? That's where you put your focus on. So of course I cry sometimes, but I'm here, <laughs> I'm alive, and I, I, the the love for my mother is in me. So I will pass it on to my children. Um, so you also talk about uh, flourishing and finding fulfillment in life uh, by doing what aligns with your nature. It's a very you know, just kind of turn of phrase um i think it can be hard to know sometimes whether something just isn't for us and we need to try something different you know whether that be a or hobby or something else or or whether you'd actually persist with it for a bit longer and try to overcome the difficulty of it um you said you tried a lot of different things since hanging up your skates did you develop a good way of knowing when to stop and when to persist with the things you were trying well, that's, I think that's what I call in a principle eight, right? Lesson eight, the map is good, a compass is better. We all want a map in life, right? This is the road you take, you do this, you go to university or you go to school, you follow this path and you will get there. Um, and you'll find out it doesn't always work like that um, because it's easy to set a goal. It's easy to say, hey, I want this job or I want to win this medal, etc. Uh, it's not easy to get there, but it's easy to set the goal. Um, and, and if we step on that path, if we go on that road, we find out, Hey, this is not what fits me or fits my nature. So if you do something only for the goal, you will not reach it because reaching a high goal takes years on year, maybe decades. And to be really, and keep, be motivated and keep that motivation. Uh, you really have to find something that aligns with your values, with your character, with your interests, with something you enjoy, with these three things. So uh, that's what I learned. I learned when I quit speed skating, I thought, oh, I'll just get an get another goal. Uh, I'll reach it and I'll be happy, etc. And I found out it didn't work that way. I tried to sell skates. I, I, I built a business. I, I tried an event. I tried just to work. The first time I did a job interview, I was 34 years old. And they asked me, tell me, Mark, where are you good at? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm really good at skating left turn left. <laughs> but I don't actually know what I'm good at, right? You know, be you learn where you're good at or not, what you like or not, what fits your value system or not, where your interest lies or not. If you set out on your path and do things, not stay grounded at your home, read books about how you should do things, but just go out there, get a job, build a business, fail, learn, <laughs> adjust. And that's what I mean by a compass. So for me, my compass, what I learned was that is where my interest lies and that's in philosophy and actually and thinking about things. How can I do this? So I, I did a lot of tests, also job tests, and I score high in metacognition. So thinking about thinking, <laughs> That's what suits me. So you can call that philosophy. So that's where my interest lies. Uh, and I love sports. So that fits me. And one of my character traits, uh, I would say, or my one of my top values is, is autonomy. So if you put me into a system which is really guarded and grounded and like a blue system, I don't flourish in that. Uh, I flourish when I take risks when there's a lot of effort somewhere, when I have to work hard, uh, deal with setbacks. So for me, that's being an entrepreneur or working together with people on projects that are really challenging. So the autonomy part fits me, the sport part fits me, and uh, the philosophy part, the thinking part. So I try to, that's my compass. Everything I do in life, uh, I try to, fit in there in that things so if there if if i step out of that zone probably do a television show about cooking <laughs> or something like that i don't really enjoy it or it, there's not that challenge for me there so i learned to say no to these things and try to focus on on the challenges i would really love to have because it's not focusing on 
uh, building a business and enjoying it for 10 years. It's sometimes gruesome or excruciating uh, when you when you face these problems. But um, there's there has to be something in there which makes you want to work at, at that problem every day. And that's, I think, where flourishing means and what the, the classical philosopher, uh, philosophers in Greece call eudaimonia. Eudaimonia, that's, it's not, they, they translate it in, in English or Dutch like in happy. It's happy, but it's not happy in the sense we know it. It's more like growing, flourishing, uh, and going somewhere. And, and and learning uh, it's not reaching an end point and then i'm happy it's i struggle with this uh, and i it's a struggle i choose to struggle with it's not the end goal it's not a map no it's the compass that fits me and everybody has to find that out for themselves like the stoics would say right it's this is a, a play we're all in uh, somebody is orchestrating this call it god call it faith call it what you will uh, lot, uh, cosmos, logic, etc. But uh, we are we are in this play. Not everything is in our control. A lot of things aren't. Uh, so we have to find out what our role is, what fits us. Uh, we can be a great carpenter, be really good at what we do, or a nurse, or uh, everybody has their own strengths, weaknesses, and role to play in life. So find out what your role is. Just go out there and try to find out what fits your character. Try to do the things you're really interested in and I think that's try don't think about think about something you would love to do for a couple of years even if you don't make money with it no, and of course I understand you want to do something and make money with it and 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 try to sustain that of course but uh, with your inter intrinsic motivation to keep it up uh, there are a lot of things that are more important I think than that to find fulfillment yeah, and flourishing is kind of a case of um, fulfilling your potential, too, isn't it? And you, you know, you instinctively know when you you aren't doing that. So it becomes a little bit easier to take action when you when you make that reflection. Yeah, and I would say, especially to younger people, right? It's it's you find out what that purpose is, or you find out what your life journey is. You set out with your with your ship, <laughs> and you go out there the on the ocean, right? You you don't know. You, you 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 cannot know uh, when you stay there and sit and try to think about this. This is not something you read in books. This is not something you do leaning back. This is just acting out and trying to get out there, and and that's chaotic. That's 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 not a set path, and that's I think where insecurity lies, where chaos lies, uh, and um, I think that's beautiful in life, right? There is no path, so it can go all ways, and that's right. Going on that's adventurous. <laughs> so look at life as an adventure. Yeah, that's good advice. Uh, so the final, final sort of question I had um, related to the the four cardinal Stoic virtues. Um, and you say that the word word cardinal derives from the Latin word cardo, which more or less translates to hinge. Um, so courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom are seen as the hinge in life, a point around which everything else turns. So. Do you have any straightforward advice on how people who want to make the cardinal virtues the hinge in their lives can make a start on that? Yeah, I would write them down and just uh, every day reflect on them. Like, uh, what are, or at the end of your day, like, what are the things I struggled with today? And if I try to find a solution to something I do, or something that doesn't feel right, or th- something I find challenging. Can I use these four car- cardinal virtues, and may- or maybe one? Maybe you can use justice, and justice is not, uh, in a sense, like abiding to the law, like we 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 uh, congregate or we we think justice means. It's more um, in in a uh, conspiracy in co-creation with other people like we don't live for ourselves only we live together with other people so do we treat them justly uh and vice versa so you can use justice if you if you work together with people is is there a balance to uh, to give and taking uh in and is that balance in the right way uh, um if you you can think about that when you 
work together with your friends or with your family or in business if you have customers or partners you work with is are things in balance do you make the right choices or uh and and the wise choices or do you do you need to show courage if you have to step out there and tell somebody or confront somebody else with something they did good or bad or you thought what could do better do you show up with courage to do that um or do you show your practical wisdom uh, and that's in the sense doing the other things uh, as good as possible uh, or are you disciplined do you show temperance or I, I for me that's a struggle sometimes you know i uh i can get emotional i have uh, my own company if things don't go well uh, and we're with a couple of entrepreneurs together right we're not like oh we're easy. No, it's not that bad. It's not. We're not like that. It's like, why did, doesn't this work? Why didn't you do that? So it gets, you know. And and it's. I think it's. I I I use this like. Okay, am I showing emotional resilience and temperance? So I can let everything out. I feel and and then I'm rid of that. But if if it would hurt my team, or the situation. Uh, that's not what I want to be about. I want to show character. I don't. I don't want to be shouting out there or putting somebody down. Uh, that's. I don't think that's worth anything, any goal, or anything you want to accomplish. So, showing temperance, emotional resilience, emotional control, disciplined to go to work every day, show yourself and the best of yourself every day, even if you don't feel like it. Uh, these are all. Uh, parts of the cardinal virtues you can reflect on every day. Yeah, I think especially when people are just getting started with stoicism, it can be difficult to understand how the virtues can guide their actions in a practical way. But it also points to the fact that philosophers like Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius advised starting small and making little progress at a time. So I think the tips you, you provided there could be very helpful. Every day you have a job to do as a human being, Marcus Aurelius would say, like, look at the birds, look at the bees, look all, they all do their jobs and you won't, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is your job as a human being. And what is your job? Well, you have to find out. Uh, you have to show up every day. Every day you give it all you have. Every day you give your best. And that doesn't mean you feel great every day, but you show up every day. Um and I think that's uh, a value that's really important. Um, and I think it helps if you dive into that, what that what the ancient Greeks and Romans meant by that, right? It, because it's not always the same in a wordly sense what we mean by the word or our pronunciation with it or or interpretation of it. So um, I think it's good to, to think about these things and to uh, reflect on them. So... It's not like reading a book, oh, this is how it works. And that's, I think, the beauty of Stoicism. It's not like something you learn and you know for the rest of your life. <laughs> it's something you try to adapt every day, day in, day out, probably to the last day of your life. Uh, because um, we are not naturally inclined always to do that. And that's okay. We're human beings. We're not sages. We're not perfect. Uh, but we can work on it every day. And as, you, as you say in the book, uh, thinking is always done in service of doing. Yeah. Which is a great line. And I think it's probably a good point to end on, to good advice. You can say that you're stoic, you can say this, or you can come up with, uh, like uh, Epictetus would say, oh, great, you know everything Chrysippus write, uh, wrote, right? You know how to interpret all the texts of these great ancient Stoics, but do you know actually what to do? <laughs> or do you show it? And you can interpret all these great texts and you can totally lose your temper uh, when you step out of this room or you step out of the uh, the, the painted porch <laughs> in Athens. Uh, so it's great you know all these things, but if you don't put them into practice uh, a couple of minutes later, uh, well, then you can, can congratulate yourself on knowing a text really well. Well, I think that's not what Stoicism is. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, Mark, thanks very much again for for joining me. I really enjoyed this. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to say about the book just before we go? Yeah, great for having me. Thank you. No, yeah, I would love to uh, come to England or the US or to talk about stoicism and to learn a lot of uh, learn more 
to to get to know more b- people in in stoicism and that's for me uh, a big factor uh, i think for me um the biggest uh motivation is that uh and why why i wrote my book is for people to have a sort of an entrance point into stoicism so it's for me i'm a normal human being i'm not an academic philosopher i'm just an athlete and i of course i've accomplished some things for sure but uh i used my life stories uh i used the lessons i learned from stoicism so somebody can get a, a hold of them in a in an approachable way and if they read my book learn about stoicism i i would love for them then to read marcus aurelius epictetus seneca um so i i i try to write an entry point to make stoicism come to life um and for people to to dive further into this philosophy so learn about all the different things and aspects of the logic the ethics the physics and um see how it can enrich their lives so you need a starting point somewhere and i hope uh well this book can provide that yeah hopefully people go and check that out i really enjoyed reading it myself uh thanks mark thanks again thank you alan thank you